Last Sabbath, we had our Jesus uh, full stop, all full stop, and it was huge. If you were here, you know about how wonderful that was. We are going to do that again next year, so it'll be even bigger, and we'll have more fun than we did this year, but I want to thank everybody who pitched in to make that work for us. A big thank you from me, and I know many of you spent hours and hours and hours pulling that together, so I thank you. Well, we looked at some parables in the book of Luke, and I want to look at one more. So please open your Bibles, if you would, for me, to Luke chapter 20. If you're using one of the Bibles in our pews, it could be on 733, the page. But Luke chapter 20, as Jesus is telling this story, and as he goes on to do it. But we have to set the setting for it in first. So we'll begin with verse 1 of chapter 20, verse 1. One day... As Jesus was teaching the people in the temple courts, he's already in Jerusalem. He'd already started the travel narrative, as it's called in Luke. He'd already made his journey, his last journey up prior to the cross. So Jesus was one day teaching uh, the people in the temple courts, and he was proclaiming the good news, or the gospel, as we would say, uh, at the time. And he said, and the chief priests and the teachers of the law gathered together with the elders came up to him. Now, most likely, these were Pharisees and these were Sadducees, but it was the Sanhedrin that came up. This was the ruling council, and they had come up to question him and ask him about it. And the reason they were coming to ask him a question was because it had been the very day, according to Mark, the very day before that Jesus had gone into the temple and turned over the tables and had cleansed the temple for the second time. Just prior, he started early in his ministry, cleansing the temple, and at the end of the ministry, where there was a lot of cheating and graft and things going on, in God's place to milk the people for a religious cause. So here they were, and Jesus came in, and he caused quite an uproar, as you can imagine, as money and coins and things went over, as he turned over the tables and drove out the money changers who were milking the people. So you go on and they say, these men, they gathered, the Sanhedrin group here that represented them, said, tell us, by what authority you were doing these things? They said, who has given you that authority? Tell us, by what authority you are doing that? Now, this wasn't really an honest inquiry. They weren't really interested in it. They were trying to trap him. You see, it was the effort about these men, if they could find an effort to trip Jesus up, that they could find something that they could pin on him for his words, that they would all be witness to it, they could pin on him, then they could go to Pilate, the Roman protector, and they would go to him and they would be able to say to him, he is worthy of death because he's causing perdition, we need to get rid of him. So there was a element in it. This was not really an inquiry to say, well, we're trying to learn something. It was really an inquiry, how can we trap him? And so Jesus replied. He realized, I realized all what they were doing. This wasn't a mystery to him. And so he replied to them and he said, I will ask you a question. Tell me, John's baptism, was it from heaven or from human origin? Now, his very way he formed that question, the very way he did that, that was a very common rabbinical question that the teachers would ask of their disciples. So he was using that as a method, a way of reminding them that he understood their, clean, their teaching and their background. So when he, they asked him a question, he turned right around and asked them a question. Now he has, he was talking about John the Baptist, of course. That's what he was talking about. The baptism that John is doing, which where thousands of people are going down to the River Jordan. Thousands of people are being baptized. They're going down and listening to John preach and proclaim as he stood on the banks of the River Jordan. If you go with me to Israel this in April, we will go there. And you'll have an opportunity. If you'd like to be baptized in the River Jordan, you certainly, we could take that opportunity. But we are going there to the spot where John the Baptist was, was preaching. And so this question that he asked him, John's baptism, the one, that one, was it from heaven or was it from human origin? What was it from? Now he's got them in a problem because they discussed, and they said, verse 5, they discussed it among themselves, and they said, if we say from heaven, he will ask, well, why didn't you believe him? And if we say, is of human origin, all the people will stone us because they were persuaded that John was a prophet. Was he a prophet? 
Jesus identified him as one of the greatest prophets, the greatest prophet that ever lived because he proclaimed the coming of Jesus, announcing the coming of Jesus. So they answered, they turned to him and they said, well, well they said, we don't know where it is from. See, they, uh, they, they were hedging on that, that, that problem with them. If you read the same story in the book of Mark, uh, I'm excuse me, book of Matthew, Matthew records, he says, they'll say, we cannot tell. In other words, we evaluate, we're not sure, we can't tell which way he came. The reality is, and as Jesus answered to them, and he said, well, neither will I tell you uh, by what authority I'm doing these things. Because you haven't answered my question, I won't answer yours. And therefore, their trap fell apart. It didn't work. Now, I would like for us to just, as we enter into this parable, to just take a deeper look at this as we look into this parable. And we're going to help you as we go along as we do this. But I'd like you to notice something about this. So we're going to take this little looking in a little deeper into this particular topic this morning. So in verse 9, he goes on. Jesus continues. It's the same crowd. They're all standing there. They're in the temple. There's the Sanhedrin. They're listening to him. And he goes on and he starts to tell this par uh, parable. And he says, I'll tell you, tell the people this parable. Man planted a vineyard. And he rented it to some farmers. And they went away for a long time. Now, the man represents God in this parable. And as we look at that, the grapevine is in this parable, represents Israel. Now, why does it represent Israel? Because it's like for us, if we saw a picture of an American bald eagle, we would say, there is the representation of our country. Because our country has said, the American bald eagle, that big, beautiful bird, represents, we've taken that as our national bird. Are you familiar with that? So the grapevine was a symbol of Israel. So this was perfectly clear to them. As soon as he said the grapevine, there was a man who had a grapevine, now they're beginning to think and go. So you should know something about this as we look at this together. Land was frequently owned by distant landlords. Now, one time I was out visiting a farmer, and I went to visit with him. He was starting to come to my church. He, he uh, farmed thousands of acres and, uh, in Central California. So I went to see him, a young guy, and I show up, and, and here he is in a suit with a white shirt, tie. And uh, he said, well, come on in. I'm just finishing my farming work. You're farming in a suit, tie, white coat. Yes, he says, I, I never go out in the field. I do it all from my office here in the house. Well, I guess that's some kind of farming. I don't know if you can do that. He says, then I get in my plane and I fly out, see how it's going. That'd be quite a farmer, wouldn't it? Well, this story in the Bible is that this farmer who was representing, farmer represented God, this man, excuse me, the man, the man going, and he hired these farmers out. So he was a distant landlord, you see. He was away, and they were to take care of it. So the tenants in this particular story, the tenants, the tenants are often sharecroppers. And if you're familiar with the sharecropping system, you work, this, you work my land, I will take part of the, the uh, proceeds, the profit from the land, and I will keep that the owner, and the rest you can keep because that'll be your pay for working it. So it's kind of a sharecropping type of an arrangement. So these tenants, these tenants had in mind that one day they would take the possession of the land. Remember the story. So he said one day they would be the owners of the land. And they said they began to think already that their land, this land was already theirs. They already had that in their mind. Remember what we're, the parable is about. So verse 10, he goes on, he says, At the harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants so that they could give him some fruit of the vineyard. Now we look at that and we see that the servants, the servants that represent the story are the prophets. And certainly the Lord sent lots of prophets, didn't he? The Bible is full of them, the prophets that were sent to warn Israel about what was taking place. And the tenants in this story, in this parable, represent the Jewish leaders. Now, this may be news to you, 
But to those who were sitting there, or standing there, listening to Jesus' story, this was, this was not very hidden. This was not very hidden. They, they got it. You know, they, were, they were catching on really quick. But the tenants, the Bible says, but the tenants beat this poor uh, servant who came and sent him away empty-handed. Sent nothing back to the owner. So he sent another one. Another servant, and on the one also they beat, they treated shamefully, and sent him away empty-handed. And so he sent a third one, and they wounded him and threw him out, threw him out, treated him terribly. Reminds me of the Bible story about the prophet Jeremiah, which the people that terribly treated, how they treated the prophet Jeremiah in that story. So Jesus goes on, and then the owner of the vineyard said. What shall I do? What shall I do? Here is the dilemma. What shall I do? We find that in other parables, that same type of question. What shall I do now that they have sent my, my servants, these three servants to them, and they beat them up, sent them out, empty-handed. What should I do? So he goes and he says, what I will do is I will send my son, whom I love, Perhaps they will respect him. The son then, what does the son represent in this? The son represents Jesus, doesn't he not? Represents Jesus. So, there Jesus came, born of a virgin, which we are getting up into the Christmas season here, not too much longer. He sent his son that we might understand God better. So he sent his son, but the tenants, the Bible says in his story, but when the tenants saw him, they talked the matter over. This is the heir. Let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Now it's interesting that in the story they threw him out of the vineyard. The vineyard represented... Israel. So they threw him out. Now it's an interesting fact that when Jesus was killed on Calvary, he was taken outside the gate. Very important phrase when he took him outside the gate. He was not killed in the old city of Jerusalem. When you go with me, you'll find that the, the, the place of Calgary is now in the city. But at that time, it was outside the city. So they took Jesus outside the city. It is very significant because Jesus died for all mankind, not just the Jews. It was important that he be taken outside the gate. And so the Bible describes in the parable that they beat this man, but they threw him out of the vineyard, you see? See that connection, that contact. So what will the owner do, Jesus said, of the vineyard? What will he do to them? When he will come, he will kill those tenants and give the vineyard over to others. Now, if you're familiar with the Bible prophecy and story, this all ties so uniquely together. Because at the end of the 490 years, 490 years, Daniel said, will be determined upon my people to make an end of the transgression. Are you familiar with that passage? If you're not, you should. It's a great passage. So, he came at the end of the 490 years, on the day, on the year, 34 AD, something very significant happened, and that was the stoning of Stephen. Now, if you read in the book of Acts, at the stoning of Stephen, when Stoven, Stephen stood before the Sanhedrin, when he proclaimed, he gave a great sermon, you can read in Acts chapter 7. He gave this great sermon outlining to them how God had worked with them all the way down to the prophets, and then they killed his son. And they got so angry with him, they drug him out, and they stoned him. And immediately after that, the gospel then goes to the Gentiles. Followed right in that storyline, right in the book of Acts, in chapter 10, he goes, he goes immediately on to the gospel to the Gentiles gets shared there. And then just a short time later, in 70 AD, while many of those people were still alive, 
the 10th Roman legion came in and held Jerusalem in siege, and Jerusalem fell in 70 AD, if you're familiar with the story. So that all exact thing that would happen, that all thing that he lined out in that parable, telling them about that parable, happened actually in the actual history, in fact, in a few short years after Jesus' crucifixion. It all pulled together. And when the people heard this, they said, Oh, God forbid that we would do that. God forbid. Particularly those Sanhedrin, those Pharisees, and they said, Oh, God forbid. I have, oh, no, it wouldn't happen. No, it wouldn't happen. It's too bad that they didn't remember that at the time of the cross to say, God forbid. They didn't. So Jesus looked directly at them. He looked directly at them. Got their attention. I can just picture in my mind how this went. And he said, then, what is the meaning of that which is written? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The cornerstone. Now, if you're not in construction, and, uh, and some of you are, have been, spent years in it, know the importance of putting a good foundation down. Uh, I've worked on, in construction, uh, and I know the process, and I was talking to somebody just the other day about this. This was kind of, you know, I was looking, and I said, oh, dear, the, um, the sheetrock there didn't get finished. I had a sheetrock business while I was at the seminary. So I said, oh, the sheetrock didn't get finished quite, quite right there. So therefore, because it didn't get finished right, the framing of the window didn't get finished quite right. Therefore, the sheetrock didn't get right because the framing of the building was not quite right. And the framer would say, well, it wasn't us, it was the guy who put in the foundation. And the foundation guy would say, it's not me, it's the guy who excavated it. And as the guy says, it's not me, it's the guy who drew the plans and laid out the survey. So you can always pass the buck down lower. You understand that in building, it's a good thing to remember. So the cornerstone, the cornerstone that was made was particularly chosen to withstand the weight of the building. It was to take the, the apex, sometimes in an arch, where the cornerstone was up there, but at other times it was laid at the foundation. It would take the most weight. So it had to be a particular type of stone. Well, in the building of the temple, the stone that was to be used, they, they, said, they kept setting it aside. So they decided, oh, it's worthless and hewn. That one won't work. They get, and finally, they, out of card, they took and they put it into the system and put it in and used it as the cornerstone for the temple. So Jesus went on and said, everyone who falls on the stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone who falls, it, uh, had, what it falls on will be crushed, will be crushed. Paul makes very clear. Jesus is the cornerstone. So that falling on, that experience that they had of the crushing when Jesus went to the cross and resurrected and lived again, their fate was sealed. Now I'd like you to notice these words here. The teachers of the law and the chief priests Look for a way to arrest him immediately. Because they knew he had spoken this parable against them. It was incredibly clear to them exactly what Jesus was talking about. So they look for a way. How can we arrest him immediately? We hate him so much. We hate what he's saying. He's challenging us and our religiosity. He's challenging our ways. He's saying things about us that are pricking at our hearts, and we just can't stand to be humiliated in front of all these people because we are the leaders, the righteous ones, and they are not. They're just the peasant people. Verse 19 says, But they were afraid of the people. They were afraid of the people. As you recall, they lost that fear later, didn't they? They lost that fear not too much longer and took Jesus, and then they met their reward in 70 AD. All right, so reflecting on that, uh, this week I've been, what does that parable have to do with me? Because the parable itself actually speaks, actually speaks to the Jewish leaders at that time. And I can kind of be comfortable. 
It's them, not me. You know, it's them. And to be honest, aren't we rather, those of us who know the Bible, aren't we rather judgmental of Pharisees? When we ever hear the term Pharisee, we go, kind of, uh, yeah, 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 I know who they are. And if we're not careful, we look around and we say, well, I bet I can pick out some Pharisees here in my... So, I was reflecting on this. And what is the meaning, significance for us today? Before the mind's eye, as centuries fade into centuries, multitudes building, the great block of granite there is at one side, rough hewn, discarded, and forgotten. Workmen stumble over it with infinite pains. They try to rid themselves of it. But the ropes break and their girders give way and it crashes down on them. Until as in a dream, it stands one day firmly in its place. And the walls hold. And the tabernacle of God is with men. The meaning for me is through that 2,000 years of history that we have had. That 2,000 years that's rolled on and on. Through all the changes that we have faced from the revolutions to the Middle Ages, to the rise of the age of reason, to the Industrial Revolution, to the, to the modern era, to the atomic age, to the information age, the technology, it just all goes. And it goes flowing by. But there crashes in the middle a promise that someday the stone will come and set up his kingdom. And the tabernacle will be with among men again. And so as I looked at that and worked that through my mind, I realized that yes, the, the power of the parable for me today is the promise of Jesus that he will come again and this world is not going to continue on as it always has. And I see those signs more clearly now than I ever have in my entire life. Some of you that are older recognize those changes, don't you? You've watched them take place in your life. And it's stunning. Some of you young folks say, to, well, this is the way it always been. Oh, no, it has not. It has not. And I've watched those changes taking place what's happening within our world. And the promise given to God, assuredly as we are standing here, is the tabernacle of God will be among men. That's the way it was to be in the beginning. That's the way it is to be in the end, that God will be with his people. And so we shall ever be with the Lord. That's it. We shall ever be with the Lord. So my goal, my life, my thing in relationship to this parable is that I would like to say to my Lord and to my King, I'm looking forward to the time when we will talk face to face, Well, I will enter into your presence where I will be with you. Now I do that in faith and through your spirit. I live in the kingdom now in this world because I'm under your authority, but someday you will tabernacle with us you will live with us in flesh and blood. I thank you, Lord, for that great promise. I thank you that we can have that in our lives and look forward to that. I thank you for the story. And even though we may think, oh, oh that all applies to those Jewish leaders, how terrible they were. The whole point of the story is that the tabernacle of God, the, the cornerstone, Jesus is the very center 
Today, I wish to make it that of my heart. In Jesus' name, amen.